Hey, Tom Community Church, Bob here. I've got Mondo and Jeff with us, and we're going to go ahead and show you a quick vid clip from the fuel project, and we're going to then do some commentary. Check it out. One of the questions I've had is whether this plague is a punishment from God or a warning from God. Is God trying to get the world's attention here through the coronavirus? Now, I don't regard myself as being a prophet, so I can't say for sure, but from the Bible I can say that it's a definite possibility that God is sending a warning here to wake the world up. There are many examples in the Bible of people sliding into apathy and sin and immorality and God using something like this to try to wake them up again. And unfortunately, when we've had a long run of easy living, as we have in the West, it is true that humans do tend to slide into apathy and sin. See, when times are good, we tend to think that we don't really need God anymore. We have our money, our food, our job, our family, our house, and so we become apathetic towards God. And sometimes it takes a crisis to jolt us back into being awake again. And this has certainly done that. The world has been sliding into apathy, turning away from God, even starting to mock God. We've seen terrible sins beginning to take hold in recent years. Millions of babies murdered through abortion, gay marriage, the affirmation of transgenderism, and so much more coming down the pipeline, it seems. In fact, the world's very much started to look like Sodom and Gomorrah, if we're completely honest. In fact, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible said the people had become flagrant with their sin. They'd actually become shameless about their sin. They boasted about their sin. And now we see the same thing happening today. Women boasting about their abortions and people sinning in a shameless and flagrant way. We see gay pride parades going down the middle of high streets in broad daylight. The world's been reaching a stage where we call good evil and evil good. It's all becoming inverted right now. And so the idea that God may send something like this to try to wake us up is extremely possible. I've heard it called a thunderclap from God. I like that terminology. The idea that God could send a thunderclap to wake us up is very likely. In fact, this is interesting. I was speaking to a couple of agnostics, or maybe there were atheists a couple of months ago. And this was before coronavirus had really affected the West. It had just got started in China, I think. And they didn't know about me. They didn't know about the fuel project. But when they found out I was a Christian, and, and this was quite early on in the conversation, the first thing that they asked me was, do you think we're living in the end days? And I replied, why, why do you think that? I was intrigued as to why agnostics or atheists would think that. And they said, well, the world is just crazy right now. 2020's just got started and Australia's been on fire. There's been floods all over the world. There's been earthquakes, volcanoes, riots, plagues of disease in China. It kind of sounds like the stuff in Revelation. And I just find that really interesting that, that the events are ramping up to such an extent that even atheists who try to suppress their God consciousness, even they are currently being woken up by the strange events. It's working. The thunderclap's working. They're, they're kind of looking around and thinking, this isn't normal. This is kind of crazy. Could God be in this? In the Bible, God says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now what's interesting to me is that the three things mentioned here in this passage as signs of God's judgment, they just so happen to be the three most notable events of 2020. The Bible says no rain is a sign, and it was the dryness and heat that led to the Australian bushfires. Locusts, the Middle East and Africa are currently going through an unprecedented invasion of locusts. I'm not sure if this has been reported much in the West, or certainly not in the UK, but hundreds of billions of locusts are currently laying waste to that part of the world. Some of the swarms are three times the size of New York City. It's a once in a generation event and are even being described as biblical in nature by the secular media. I would also argue that our supermarket shelves being stripped bare puts us in mind of locusts. And then the Bible talks about pestilence too. And again, we're currently going through an unprecedented pestilence in the form of coronavirus that has literally shut down and got the attention of the entire world. These three things mentioned in the Bible as warning signs from God have all come one after the other in 2020. And in that exact order too. When we read the Bible and we see those three things put together as a sign of God's judgment for wickedness, and then we look at the world today and see those three things taking hold on an unimaginable scale, there is compelling evidence to think that God is sending us a message here. 
And according to this verse, this is what he wants from us in response. He wants us to humble ourselves, to seek him once again, and to repent of our sin. And that's what I would call the world to do right now, to come before God with humility, to repent of the sin that we've been sliding into over recent years, and to re-establish righteousness in our land. If we do it, God may have mercy, but if we ignore this thunderclap and continue down the present path, I personally wouldn't be surprised if even bigger things happen in the time ahead. And I think as a church we have to repent for allowing the world to slide into immorality on our watch. I think the church, because things have been so good for us in the West for so long, we too have often been quite apathetic and timid in confronting the moral decline that we see around us. I think as a church we need to repent if we've chosen comfort over obedience in recent years and we need to speak up more boldly even when it's costly. And certainly I think we need to intercede on behalf of our nation in these times. So one, one of the points that was somewhat convicting right, on a personal level, but yet definitely for our culture, was he starts talking about the apathy in our world and how basically we, we've cozied up to sin, not necessarily the church, but certainly our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, he mentions that we, you know, that which is evil we call good. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is followed up by the shamelessness with, that we mm -hmm. find in our culture. Yeah, do, do you remember how shamelessness was born in our culture? Do you remember where that came from? Hmm. Modern psychology oh, yeah. decided yeah. that uh, feeling guilty about something was, was a bad thing. Yeah. It was wrong. And so, so their problem, you know, basically they thought, well, the problem is guilt. You know, not the fact yeah. that you're transgressing and sinning and harming people. So the idea is to eradicate guilt. And, uh, and do you remember some of the antics they did and some oh. of the coachings? Yeah. Well, that grew through the academia community. I mean, it just continued, and it's just, as it is today, it's swelling. It is. And, it is. and it's reached into the media, it's reached into the TV, it's reached into movies and everything we see, which we, we, we roll our eyes at, now we just shrug it off. Our apathy yeah. is yeah. Yeah. We're being, we just we're kind being of like, oh, well, it's just part of what life is. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting is uh, the apathy, which mirrors indifference, which, which is really the opposite of, of love, right? And the apathy is running hand to hand with the postmodern culture. Mm -hmm. If there is no truth, how can you rise to any challenge? What gives you any reason to stand up against anything if everything's relative? Well, that's where you always get, well, that's your belief, or that's your point, or that's your morality plumb line. It's not, not necessarily everyone's. Exactly. And truth doesn't become relevant. <laughs> no, it never has. It, well, we're dealing with it, I mean, is the fruit of humanism. That's really going all the way back to, to Darwin and others through the turn of the you know, 1900 into, with the, the advancement of psychology. But it, it, humanism is the standard. So really, as Christians, we're not surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that here we are now with you know, close to 200 years of evolutionary thinking. Or you know, if you put um, psychology you know, with uh, Nietzsche and these guys now we're dealing with a hundred or a century, centuries worth of humanistic, secular, psychological thinking. And why are we surprised that they would want to get rid of guilt? You know, it, it's not, again, and here we are with, when you go, get a go, when you go off of God's word, as you mentioned, the absolutes, the standards, this is where we end up. Yeah, and, it, and it's a, a tragic hole we find ourselves in, too, because... In, in, in witnessing and sharing the truth and the love of God, you have to, in, in some senses, rebuild the possibility of something being true. Yeah. Other, word, other words, you just brushed off. And that's where, you know, the apathy just runs wild. Um, and if it feels good, do it. The battle cry from the 60s has just run amok. Um, we've talked about the soft attributes of God yep. being lifted up in our culture. And this is the mess we find ourselves in. And so... We see that uh, the, the, the issue here um, that he brings forth is, is this, a, you know, he doesn't put the, pit them against each other. Is it a judgment? Is it a warning? It's kind of part of the question. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, I, but I think both are beneficial. Mm -hmm. what, what say you? You know what, what falls in mind is you, you stated that, and I'd sent that vid clip to other people, and the response I got back was interesting. It's, well, you just got to let your conscience be your guide. Well, mm -hmm. what's the bottom line for consciousness? I mean, again, you got to fall on some morality plumb line, yeah, some standard. And if everybody's setting their own, is the way it was indicated to me, is how they viewed the the, the, the vid clip. 
it depends on who this who we're talking to, right? As uh, anybody that's going to be a speaker is going to say, well, who's my audience? I mean, you know this more than anybody in that if you're going to speak to the church, kind of like preaching to the choir, you're going to be talking to someone who has the same world worldview as you. But if we're talking, if we're, we're asking that question, is this a warning? And we're presenting it to the world. Um, I think we will have might have two different answers there because in one sense, the, the, the atheist or the, the agnostic secularist, whatever, they're going to, they're going to point out logically some of the things that we have to be careful of. For example, if we say, well, this is a warning, and we say, and we, if we say this is a warning, they're going to go, well, a warning of what? A warning by who? And a definition of a warning is somebody sending it. And so the implication is, is that God is sending this warning, and therefore they're going to go, oh, you really think God is sending a warning? And then they're going to say, oh, so God sent the COVID. God sent this, this disease, you know, and so we have to say, well, so when he, when he says this is a warning, I'm going to step back from that at all because even though he said I'm not a prophet and that's wise of him, but in reality, I don't see this as a warning sent by God in that sense. What we do is we look at all of our world, all of the fallen world from the beginning of, you know, Genesis 3, that anything that evil, anything that, that is evil this, and that, that happens is a is a sign of God's judgment against sin generally. So this comes along. Does God use it to wake people up? Yes. But because God uses something is not equivalent to God sending it. Yeah. So that, we have to make sure we understand that because as we discuss this with people, you know, I, I, I would I would even reject the word warning at all. I would just say, hey, this is an evidence of us living in a fallen world that sin brought. And God uses all things, even things that he doesn't cause. You know, when an earthquake happens, right? I mean, somebody dies, earthquake comes and it kills Christians and non-Christians. Well, did God send the earthquake? So then if God did as a judgment or a warning, did he kill the Christians just as much as he killed the non-Christians through that earthquake or through COVID or through 911, you know, whatever. We just have to be really careful in our language. And I think he was careful some, but I don't think he was careful enough, honestly, even by bringing up the word. Yeah. That's just my thoughts on it. Yeah, but, it, but it's interesting because in one sense, we can just span the time of history mm -hmm. and find all sort of, sorts of historical you know, train wrecks, so yep. to speak. And, and one, of the, one of the ways I've said this is this is just a, a garden variety form of the fallen nature of man. Yep. And because when things go wrong in a person's life, you've know, you, you got to ask, you know, if, if I'm a child of God and I'm his... I'm his son, and he loves me like a son. He, he will discipline me individually mm -hmm. to, to have me repent <coughs> and, and, and become more Christ-like. Or maybe it's a pruning. That's another way I've yep. looked at it. Pruning feels pretty awful. You know, that's something that, that, that really uh, seems like a punishment or seems like some kind of judgment. But in reality, God is just lightening your load to move quicker and follow closer after him. So a pruning can f be painful. And then the third thing, of course, like, like we're talking about, is just a garden variety, you know, just it, it happens because we're a fallen creature. Yeah. And, and it's under that category. But we do find these opportunities, if we frame it in a warning, wake up call, I mean, attendance after 9-11 in church spiked for a little while. So there is these opportunities yeah. to, to take and say, look, you know, this, this world is fragile and it's, it's, it's not what it's supposed to be, and it's, it's under the curse of sin, and that's why things are happening the way they're happening. And God has written eternity on the heart of man, yeah. so we can try to get them to wake up and try to say, hey, well, why, you know, what happens when you die? What are you afraid of if you're a chemical bag of, you know, yeah. of whatever's... From the sovereignty of God perspective, you know, we, we know that all things are under his sovereign rule, and there's no doubt, um, instead of even asking the question, um, is this a warning, the, the better question is, hey, no matter what happens, um, how is God going to use it? How can, how can we take these opportunities, as we saw in the previous part of the, the video, if somebody watched that, but in the sense that, wow, this happened. We know that God is always eager to reach mankind, mm -hmm. and therefore this creates an opportunity for us to take advantage of this negative thing and to talk about things that people normally wouldn't be willing to talk about. Kind of like you said with 9-11, people are all of a sudden open to having a discussion about eternal ultimate things, which is great. God didn't need to cause that for us to have that conversation. And so as Christians, we, we don't, I, I, to me, I say, who cares it, what, what it is? But what, do, what I do care about is taking advantage of the, the opportunity we have to talk to people that are 
now have a little bit of fear yeah. or concern, for sure. Yeah, but people do like to analyze. Because I think deep down inside, probably due to the fall nature of man, is, mm-hmm. is we have a sense when things go bad, I must have did something wrong. Yeah. That's just an innate sense <laughs> right. of mankind. That's and the natural guilt that we have, yeah, right? The it's conscience. Just, it's just a natural guilt. Mm-hmm. So people will ask that question. Yeah. And I think as, as Christians, God is sovereign. So yes, God did cause it. He did send it, so on and so forth. But not for any reason or purpose that, that yeah. you and I can understand. Discern, and, no. and you see in Scripture, you know, as you mentioned, God does discipline his kids. And so if, if something negative happens in my life, I always ask, did I do something wrong? Did I need a discipline? Or is this just part of the fallen world that I live in? Yeah. You know, I'm going to get, or, you know, does God have something else trying to get my attention? But you also see, for example, in Acts chapter 12, where he sends an angel to judge Herod. Well, he's a secular guy. He's not a Christian and God's not disciplining yeah. him. That was judgment. But we have the scriptural text to tell us that. Yeah. But if we see another guy die from a sickness, uh, some political leader, sure. we, we, can't, we can't say with definitiveness Hey, the God did that. Yeah. You know, there, there's a difference in that regard. We have to just be humble. Yeah. So, but to me, that's where again we take advantage and remind people, no matter what. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. He did have an atheist. That's, you know, that's the sudden, key you got to hit on. Yep. Yeah. Because with the atheist, he he clarifies that. And I thought the question he came back with the atheist was, "Why do you ask that question?" Mm-hmm. And and and, at, and the second time I watched the video, I'd ask the question that I've heard you ask is, well, what happens when you die? Yeah. What do you think happens when you die anyway? yeah, what, what do you think happens anyway, when you die? Whether now or later, yeah. Because yeah. their worldview well, doesn't have fear in that regard. At least it's not supposed to, because they're just, you know, a chemical reaction waiting to, to die. You're vapor. Yeah. So that, that's where I saw that, and that's where the question was directed after the warning. He talked about the warning, and he's talking to the atheist, and he, or he said atheist or agnostic, but he, he, he clarified it by... Saying, well, what, you know, why do you ask that question? Which was, I thought, interesting. Why, why are you asking that question? Yeah. Now they based their answer on, well, something's happening. The world's gone crazy. People are nuts, or whatever. But there would have been a perfect to intervene and say, well, what happens when you die? Yeah, exactly. You get right, in, right into the gospel. I think with two, when we come, we're asking these questions because, you know, he said people are asking, is this a sign of the end? You know, a sign yeah, of the end yeah. times. And what we do know is that things are going to get worse and worse. There's no doubt. There, the, the, pestilences, earthquakes, you know, um, wars, rumors of wars. All, rum, this is all Matthew 24. You know, you, you look at it, and we know where it's going. And so these things are just par, par for the course. But they're also heading to a very specific time of the end. This isn't going to go on forever. So when we see these things, Jesus did say, hey, the end is not yet. Uh, I'm with you always. Be of good cheer. But nevertheless, we also we also know that, depending on your theology, that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. So we, we don't. The question is, is that um, do we expect you know some end time revival? Uh, we all hope for that. Sure. Yeah. We we hope for that, and we don't know that God might have a short revival here, and then then He lets it. But we do know the overall progression is down. There isn't going to be this big turn, you know, of winning the world for Jesus necessarily, not according to how close we are to the end of the age, yeah. because the love of many will grow worse and worse. It's going to get worse, but there might be these little bits. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and you can't help but mention a post-millennial perspective mm-hmm. where things are going to get better. And there, this is where a lot of people, a lot of churches teach a type of eschatology that mm-hmm. once again, could have sound doctrine in regards to the gospel, but they but they but they're so um, focused on fixing this world. Fixing, it, yeah. And and uh, yeah, I don't That's, know. I mean, sometimes it, they feel bad for abandoning it in the sense that I, I talk to people and you just realize that that they're not getting it. You know, the Lord hasn't opened their mind or their heart up to the gospel, and so to to teach them in you know moral improvement to just mm-hmm. give them commandments or rules to live by to improve their life morally which will improve our status in this world or the condition of, of our country it's all good and fine but it, but it's a dead end yeah. it does you, you, they need to know who the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. is I've seen this lately in uh, really I think people who mean well theologically you know whether they're pastors and so um, they're quoting Second Chronicles seven thirteen and fourteen but God does not deal with 
at least in the New Testament, we don't see it anywhere. God does not deal with nations. You know, he dealt with the nation Israel. That was a very special economy, if you want to see dispensation, if you want to use that word. But today, you know, what, what, what would make America a Christian nation? 51% of people live, I mean, I mean what, yeah. what makes it a Christian yeah, nation? Yeah. We, you, can, you can have a whole bunch of different uh, definitions of that. Sure. Our goal isn't to make America a Christian nation. Our goal is to extend the kingdom, seek first the kingdom, and extend God's kingdom that is beyond borders, right? It's beyond nationalities. We're to win everybody. But what we're after is the individual. Now, if there's enough individuals, 99%, does it still call it a Christian nation? God would say, look, I have no agreement with the nation. I have an agreement with the individual who puts their faith in me. Yeah, and basically we're not of this world. We're, no. our, we're resident aliens. Yep. And, our citizenship is in heaven. Our kingdom's not here. Yeah, yeah. So that, that type of terminology does, does rather quickly right my ship, in the, so to speak. Mm-hmm. That basically I get all involved. I'll watch some political rally or some politician want to vote this or that, and then I get all excited yeah. and scream at my TV. But the point is, this, this is all going to burn up. This, this yeah. isn't it. The, my salvation and my, my right living is... Is not legislated by Congress. Yeah, that, that makes for a real, real problem. Rain, locusts, and pestilence. So there you have it. That uh, seems to be on the horizon, and uh, I think uh, we've uh, covered this point uh, quite readily. And so, thank you, guys. Thank you.